sell or buy 20 accountancy practices. So at least 20 accountancy practices. And as I say, Ian was introduced to me by a member of the community. And this morning, you've got an opportunity to ask Ian any questions that you would like around buying and selling and merging uh, accountancy practices. I have over on my uh, top left a list of questions that you have sent in when you've registered, which I will ask as we go through. I've also got some questions prepared that we're going to be asking Ian. And as always, uh, you have the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's two little speech marks uh, with Q&A underneath it. If you click that, then you can ask the questions in the Q&A box. And also, if you click the chat box, uh, you can post comments and nice things uh, in there as well uh, to tell me how you're getting on. But if you are asking a question, ideally, can you ask it in the Q&A box so uh, to kick us off ian uh, the subject or the headline was dead clients and grim tales ian can you just uh, share me how many dead clients have you bought or sold over the years <laughs> yeah morning everybody in worthington uh, from since i'm a corporate lawyer um uh, uh been involved in uh, mergers and acquisitions work for the entirety of my working life which is more years than i care to to actually remember. Um, uh, I always approach uh, these kind of transactions, you know, you can, you've got two sides of the fence. Either you're a seller where you've got one set of considerations and you're, or you're a buyer with a different set. And I think from a seller's perspective, uh, you ask yourself, what, what do I actually want out of this? You're selling your life's work out. Uh, basically, you want to keep the cash uh, that you've been, that you've received or that you're due to receive over a period. Um, as a buyer, uh, different consideration, you actually want to make sure that you get what you think you're paying for. Um, and just picking up on the, on the, on the kind of question you've, you've just raised, Simon, is the importance for, for a buyer of doing proper due diligence. Uh, it's not enough to have a cursory look at what you're buying, you need to have as close a look as possible. Um, the dead client reference, I had one particular client and happily I, I wasn't actually involved in the, in the deal itself, um, but he came to me about six months down the line and said, look, I, 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 I need some help here. I, I actually bought a practice out. Um, I have to confess, I did no due diligence whatsoever. I didn't even see the client list until the day of completion. Uh, and I've discovered that of the 30 or 40 clients on that list, uh, three are dead. Um, another three corporate clients have been either wound up or in, in the process of being wound up. And what was listed as three or four clients are actually members of the same group. And the gross recurring fees against each one happened to be the same and had been repeated. So what I thought I was buying a GRF of 90,000, I was actually buying GRF of 60 before I even got stuck into the client base. And so it's illustrative of, of for, for a buyer, for me, the, the, the big thing is yes, you know, you can, you can build in all sorts of protections into your legal documentation, but it, it's no substitute for doing thorough, proper due diligence. So if, if there are things in there that aren't right, you find out about it before you commit. And either you can then look at it and say, no, it's not for me, it's not what I thought it was and walk away, or look, look back at the price and say, this isn't worth this, I'm prepared to pay that, but I, I'm, you know, I, 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 I can't take this on um, at the price that you want to, to actually get for it. And so for a seller, uh, obviously you, you want to, uh, things to go as smoothly as possible. And you don't really want uh, a buyer crawling over your, your business too closely, talking to your staff, maybe wanting to talk to some of your clients, sampling your files. But if, if you want to sell your practice, um, I'm afraid that that can come with the territory if the, if the buyer is doing a proper job. Uh, so beware dead clients, yeah. They, they, beware they of dead are clients. About, so just, 
just to cover that off, I've got your question, Craig, and we, we're going get to get to that in just a, a, a minute. But just covering that off then, uh, Ian, how, how do we go about that? So I'm buying a practice. Um, I'm, I'm going to, let's call them Mrs. Jones, for argument's sake, that I'm going to buy the practice off. Do I have to go through, in your opinion, do I go through each client name and say, are they dead or alive? Is it, is it a bit of a game like that? Because what, what I found when I've bought practices is most practitioners don't want to give me a list of people that they're selling to me they might give me a list of anonymized amounts but yep. uh, what what practical things could i do in order to make sure that i don't buy dead clients yeah i don't think you can you can look at every at every client in any kind of detail um but i do think you know if, if you if you let's say you're 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 buying a practice by reference to 100 grand's worth of grf what i would expect to see is a list of 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 clients and against each client name um what what part of that grf is comprised in their in their fees so you've you've got an idea of, of who the clients are you you know that if you lose four of them and have to claw back part of the price you you've you've got a grf figure that you can base your your your, your claw back on so you need to know what client base you're actually buying um, and then I would look at the, at the, you know, if, if there are obviously key clients there, you know, if, if there are clients who, who comprise quite a large amount of, of the GRF and, and others say, if, if you take a sample of even 10, 15% to say, I, I, I want to see, um, some of those client files. Um, I, I want to see the quality of the work that's being done. I want to see the type of work that's being done. I want to see how well they pay. You know, are, are they, are they people I have to chase to the ends of the earth to actually get my invoices paid or are they good payers? And what kind of relationship has the seller had with that client that comes through the file? Is it, is it fairly arm's length? Is it quite frosty or is it, is it a, a decent, good working client relationship that's open uh, where the client feels it can, it can be candid with, with the the advisor and the advisor feels it can be candid with the the client so I, I don't think you can look at every every client on that list um but you'll and so the, 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 there may be dead clients who who crawl under the barbed wire so to speak but it, it will give you an idea that say if you sample a decent number uh that those clients actually do exist and it, they kind of do what they say on the tin and so if you say, well, I've looked at 15% at random and they're okay. So the chances are that the rest are going to be okay too. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a kind of case of being sensible. Of course, your seller um, ought to get an NDA uh, from the buyer first up. So, you know, you could, it's, it's normally two or three page, fairly standard document. Um, and you could say, well, and I actually do say to clients, NDAs are all well and good and they look great on paper, but actually policing them is, is, is a different matter. And how do you know um, that if the deal falls apart, that the buyer is not taken away, knows your pricing policy, knows who your clients are, uh, that over, over a period you can make surreptitious approaches to them or find a way of getting the ones on board that he, that he actually wants. And you, you'll also see... Um, you know, if you can look at the details of any, any claims history through the insurers or any, any complaints, you know, have these clients got a history of complaining about, about nothing or, or have complaints that are actually quite legitimate, which then brings into, into question the quality of the output of the seller or the seller staff. Because if you're inheriting the seller staff, and that's, that's another tricky issue is, is at what, at what stage do uh, is is a possible sale floated past as a seller your your staff because sure as eggs they they'll be unsettled by it and that's another way that that your clients might find out about a sale not from you because if I'm a client I I don't want to find out you're maybe selling your practice from a manager or I want to find out from you uh, and so so again it's it's a delicate balance. Mm. Okay. Yeah, 
Thank you. So uh, a, a huge amount of trust then by the sounds of it. Uh, we've got, we got lots of questions coming in, lots of them are around uh, price and uh, payment proposals. Uh, so let, let's, let's go there then, Ian. So f firstly, what is this magic thing called GRF? So we, we often hear about once times and uh, et cetera of GRF. Um, I'm, I'm having a, de a debate uh, <laughs> all the time about, from a Greenstone's perspective, what is GRF and what's not GRF? In your opinion, what is GRF, gross recurring fees? Well, if, if you look at the kind of classic definition of, of GRF, it's, it's um, fees for work of a recurring nature. Some of it's obvious, you know, if you look at the most compliance works, statutory accounts, um, tax returns, tax comps, maybe payroll, maybe VAT return work. Uh, it, it's when you, you, you're into greyer areas like R&D tax credit work, for example. You, you might say, well, that, that's recurring work because with most companies, it's, in my experience, it's, it's an ongoing application that they make. But is it, is it the same or is it uh, in the same vein as, as, as annual statutory accounts or monthly management accounts or whatever? And, and I think... It, in a sense, the, the key to it is, is, is what the buyer and seller agree between them counts for G, as, as GRF for the purposes of their agreement and actually what doesn't. And, and I've seen agreements where, where you've, you've had GRF defined. So it, it'll be okay. GRF e, is this type of work, A, B, C, D, E, and it's definitely not one-off tax investigation advice, corporate finance advice, tax planning uh, exercises, which are, might be a one-off, um, but you, you, you don't get them every year. And the, the point of having a GRF-based price for a buyer, certainly, is, is that he knows, or she knows, that, that over a period, that, that work is going to be there. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of basis of a, 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 your business model, really. For, for lawyers, our, our business model is much less effective than that because we, we start on day one of each financial year not having a clue whether we're going to bill X, Y or nothing. So you, you can't really say, whereas with this, if you look at it and say, well, if I take that practice, what would I, what can I reasonably expect that client base to spit out year on year on year? Yes, there'll be, there'll be fall offs and, and people change, but by and large, if I take that particular client, what, what, what can I be relatively confident that, that, that he will spit that, that, that kind of work out month after month after month or year on year on year? Because that, that's what I'm basing my, my kind of price on. And I think if you, again, it's sometimes I'm, I'm surprised at how little negotiations gone on between buyer and seller on, on key issues like this before they get to the point where they're into heads of agreement and so and where again these issues just aren't addressed and quite a few of the of the kind of buying and selling agencies don't really address it either they don't get, get down to kind of nuts and bolts of, of what what grf is and what it isn't and i think the buyer and seller should sit down with a list of work that they that they actually do and say are we are we going to include this or is it is it taken as uh, as um, recurring or non-recurring and again, just going back to what we talked about previously, if, if you look at your client list, and again, this particular client found this as well, you, you, you've got a client and it's got six grand worth of GRF against its name. And you think, that's great, that's six grand, that goes to the hundred grand in total. You then drill down through the files, or you, you don't have a closer look at that, and you'll see that of that six grand that was billed last year, four grand was because they had a tax investigation. And there's only two thousand pounds worth of it actually is for work that's going to recur next year and the year after so basically if you can actually between the two of you buyer and seller agree what is gr is gross recurring work or, or gross recurring fees and what isn't so you then know that when you come to measure it at the end of year one and the end of year two there's no dispute or if possible as to what grf is and what it isn't because in the end as a, as a lawyer i'm always trying to do agreements that that cut out the scope for dispute so the more certainty you've got you might not like 
what the certainty spits out. But if you both know what you're dealing with, what the playing field is, it's much more, it's much better to, to then know if you fall out, how it's going to fall, or that, that you, you, you're aware of what the ground rules are, rather than ignore it or kick it into the long grass because in the hope it doesn't. And this thing about what is GRF recurs quite a bit. Actually. Yeah. So in, in summary, G GRF is what we agree it is at the outset, but you need to agree it rather than assuming that, 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 that it's one's times fees or whatever. Yeah. And then you need to check that they've not got two years worth of accountancy fees in one year's worth of figures for, for, yeah. for argument's sake. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, just to finish on Susan, uh, it's an NDA, Susan. It's a non-disclosure agreement oh, yeah. and it's, that's okay. It's, it's yeah. Yeah, the, the technical job. So it's agreement between both parties, basically not to disclose any uh, conversations around the agreement. So it's a confidentiality agreement in effect. So it just is, always bear in mind they are of limited use, but certainly worth having because it focuses the buyer's mind. It's a, well, you know, if, if I, if I do misbehave, I have signed this agreement, and so there is some legal recourse. But policing it, yeah. I, whenever, whenever I talk to customers about it, I always talk that it's more threat. So it's 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 more threat than what than, than actually action because you've got to prove it and all the yep. other stuff that goes along with yeah. it. And yeah. yeah. So let's just just talk about values then. So what are you seeing at the moment in the market? Um, is it is it a percentage of fees or is it on EBITDA? And have you done anything recently to suggest that? COVID-19 has affected it or not affected it, Ian? I don't know about, about COVID. I mean, it, it's, it, what I've been finding is there are, at the minute, I've seen very few, if any, EBITDA-based valuations. It seems that with professional practices, um, I do quite a bit of IFA work as well, and they, they're, again, based on recurring, recurring fees rather than profit. Um, and it, it seems to vary on this between 0 0.8 times GRF on the one hand and maybe 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 at the, at, the, at, the, at the top end. And there are various factors that, that, that actually affect that or dictate it. I think one of the big ones is the quality of the, of the client base itself. You know, if it's, if, if, if it's got a number of, of good corporate clients in who are, are likely to, to generate some decent fees going forward, um, you'll attract a higher multiplier than if you've effectively got a, a large amount of sole traders or, or you know, the kind, kind of classic fish and chip shop or news agent or builder. That's not to actually denigrate that kind of work. It's simply a, a fact that it, that will attract a lower multiple than if you've got several decent corporates who spin out a variety of kind of work. So the scope for wider non-recurring work, if you like, in a corporate, you know, whether it's making an acquisition or a more complicated tax structure is more likely than if you've got the, the basic sole trader type accounts that are going to be the same year on year. Um, and I think that's probably the most pertinent factor in, in determining what, what the um, multiplier is. Again, if you look at the average fee per client is another, is another determinant. So if you've, if you've got a lot of 500 pound a year um, fees, that's probably going to attract less than if you, if your average fee is, is four figures. So if you, if you into the thousands rather than the hundreds, chances are you're going to, it's, it, it's indicative of a, of a better client base and that's going to attract a higher, higher multiple. Um, with individual clients, again, and this is again down to due diligence, just have a look at their age profile. You know, if you've got, if you've got 30 individual clients and they're all, they're all over, you know, then in their late fifties, you've got to think, well, how long are they going to be around as a client? You know, it's, if they're in their early mid thirties or early forties, then it's, it's uh, probably a better bet and will, will again, maybe attract a higher, higher price, provided you find out about it as a, as a, as a, a buyer. Um, you, you, you might, well not find out about it unless you you know going back to what we talked about earlier back to the due diligence point and i can't emphasize how key that is mm -hmm. uh, lots of, of this comes back to as, as a buyer in particular the more you know about what you're purporting to buy the better um uh, and 
again, just looking at price, you know, circumstances, if it's a distressed sale, then clearly um, you, you're, I mean, I've, I've done a couple at 0 0.5 from actually buying, buying uh, from an administrator. Um, what's going to be interesting, and I've heard various opinions from, from people about what's going to happen with, as a result of the COVID thing, is, is a, a number of, of people I act for who are quite acquisitive and are looking to, to, fit, to, to actually build a box of fees or build a business through, through acquisition, that they think there'll be some what they call bargains to, to be had, um, either because the smaller practices are, are just under pressure or, or people have just felt, you know what, I've had enough of this. This is, it's kind of time to get out. Um, I, d I don't know how secure my client base is anymore. Uh, I know there's, they're all still around, but once, once furloughing is, is ended, um, I don't know how many of these are going to actually throw the towel in and, and walk away. So I'm, go I'm going to do that now, or I'm, I'm going to sell now before that actually bites kind of three months down the line. And I think price, will reflect that so if you if you are looking to 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 acquire I, I think now's a good time to have a look around because i think there will be practitioners and and and, and professionals who who've who've had enough and want to want to get out and and of course in the end it's like anything else supply and demand isn't it you know if you if you've got a, a a prize practice comes up for sale in a prime spot um there might be a number of firms after it which is going to push the price up and again location is kind of another factor you think well you know if if, if it's on the m25 or it's you know down silicon valley you you, you might get more uh, th than you would in 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 certain other parts of the country i won't i won't be specific because I, I, don't, I don't want to offend anybody but i am from stoke so i you know i, I can I, I can't throw stones really so it, it, it's that that kind of thing that uh, attract fire. I often wondered why more of these practice sales aren't EBITDA based, but at the minute that in my experience that doesn't doesn't appear to be the case. It's still the traditional way of kind of turnover based really. Yeah, so not not EBIT, EBITDA <laughs> and then between 0.8 and 1.2 times GRF, whatever GRF is defined as, uh, and it will be higher based around the quality of the customer, the bigger corporate customers because yep. there is more scope to upsell to those uh, and that's often reflected in the average fee per client is my sort of summary of what you've just Correct, uh, yeah. what you've yeah. just shared. Brilliant. Okay. Um, in the wrong profession Simon well, I don't, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, well, we can get into accountancy and legal and being paid per word if you're a lawyer and all sorts of stuff like that, which I uh, which I won't do on this in this conversation. So right, we've worked out what the price is, Ian. Um, how typically how do we pay for it? What's the what's the process for paying for it? Again, the tr tr traditional way it's, it's been done uh, is um, half up front. So if you've if you've agreed 100k, you'll say, okay, I'll pay you 50,000 now, 25,000 at the end of year one, 25,000 at the end of, of year two. Um, which again, for the seller, raises a number of implications, uh, all of which work around how do I ensure that I get that second 50,000? The first 50,000 I've got on my pocket, I keep that. And most deals are structured so that any clawback provisions, which we'll talk about in a second, don't apply to that, that, that initial 50,000. So a seller can be confident that he can put that money in his pocket or her pocket and keep it, whatever happens going forward. Now, as a, as a, a seller, you know, effectively, you're lending that, that second 50,000 to the buyer. Um, and, and it's your life work you're selling out. So uh, you need to be as certain as you can that, that you'll actually get that money when, it, when it's due. You, you, you've got two real considerations. One is the, is the clawback consideration or how clawback works is you will say, look, uh, you know, if, I'm, if I'm buying one times GRF, and GRF's 100,000, I, I will measure the performance of the of the client base over over a period it might be one year it might be two years it might be an average of the performance over 
over the first year and the second year. And if it turns out that that client base that, that I've based my, my price on of 100,000 actually spits out 70 rather than, a, than, than, than 100, there's a 30 grand shortfall. And, and in, in, in crude terms, um, 30 times one is 30. I'm going to take 30,000 off the price. And so that the deferred consideration or price, 50,000, suddenly becomes 20. Uh, and so I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll not pay you the first instalments of 25 at all, and, and, and I'll keep five of the second instalment. And so in basic terms, that's how clawback works. And as a, as a, as a seller, you've got the vulnerability to, to, to that. And there are all sorts of, uh, it's, it, it, it's quite complex of itself as clawback. You know, you, 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 is, it, is it based on fees received or is it based on fees invoiced? Um, now, as a, as a buyer, I'm going to say, well, it's got to be fees received. Otherwise, you know, I've bought a client base that's a bad payer or doesn't, doesn't translate into cash. The seller's going to pay. It's going to say, well, hang on a minute. It, it worked fine for me. Yes, some of these clients need to be managed, but um, I, I don't control the invoicing or the collection after, after completion. It's down to you. I've, I've passed that client on to you and he's engaged you to do work. So as far as I'm concerned, job done. That, that, that client is now your client and it's up to you what you, you actually make of it. And if you, if you do a bad job or whatever and the client doesn't pay you or you, you allow that client too much leeway in, in terms of the credit lines that you, you extend to him, that, that's your lookout, not mine. And I, I shouldn't be penalised by reason of, you, of your, your particular failure. And, and it's there that you, you, you're kind of looking at clawback. And, and, and again, you can build this into the, into the, the agreement. It's called legitimate uh, cause in, in, in terms of, of how it's structured. But the kind of seller will say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to pass this client base across to you. And if it doesn't, doesn't come over, then I, I accept there's got to be some clawback. But if, if, if the clients defect because you decide to stick your prices up by an amount that, that's unsustainable um, or you just don't service the clients well enough, you know, I've, I've given them good service, technically correct, you know, they're, they're very happy. Turns out the service you give them is several notches below that and they, they look at it and say, well, I'm not staying here anymore because the service isn't good enough. I'm going to take a walk and go and, and kind of march up the road. Um, then I, I shouldn't be penalised by that. You have to carry the risk because going forward, you, you control the service that's given to the client. And if you lose the client, then that's your that's your lookout, not mine. And I, and I don't actually see why you should operate a clawback. And so that that that's often forms the basis of some quite interesting negotiation between buyer and seller as to as to how clawback operates and and how far. Um, a seller can protect itself by 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 effectively carving out those areas of 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 of, of clawback that that shouldn't apply because it's down to the buyer's failings you know rather than the seller you know, if a if, if a client goes bust halfway through year two um whose fault is that you know when i the seller handed that client over it was fine uh, you know, COVID hadn't happened. It's, it was going like a train, and and suddenly, eighteen months later, a client that was uh, was worth twenty grand has, has suddenly disappeared. Now, who 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 bears the risk of that? Is it is it the seller who's without fault, or is it the, is it the buyer who's actually without fault? But whatever happens, that client's disappeared, and lots of, of transactional work when you do a deal like this is about risk. It's about managing risk but it's also a portioning risk. Now that risk of that client going bust isn't going to go away. It, 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 it exists. And what the buyer and the seller have to decide is who, who bears that risk and whether that has a, any kind of pricing implications going forward. Again, so the, and the, obviously the best time to decide that is when in the actual uh, heads of terms. So before you actually get past, before you actually start having an argument about it, it should be in the yeah. agreement and decided before you start. Yeah. So just to, to summarize that then, generally speaking, payments 50% upfront 
and then two lots of 25%. And I very often hear of accountants talking about payment over three years when they actually mean payment in three installments, which is actually yep. two years. Yep. Yep. Um, and then am I right in saying that in some clawback agreement, you can decrease the percentage. So the longer that you have a customer as a buyer, the longer you yep. have a customer, the lower the claw pack percent. So it might be a hundred percent, say for the first six months and then 75% for month yep. six to 12. And you, you can negotiate around all of those different variables. Is that, is that right in? It is. Yeah. I've, I've even seen it where a client's defected in or, or gone away in year two is that the uh, seller's allowed to keep a certain level of the, of, of the, of the fees that have been invoiced in, in, in year one, it can be traditionally, it seems to be about 30, 33 to 35%. Um, and again, the, these are, are refinements that, that, that need to be agreed um, in an agreement. So it's not just a case of saying, you know, how clawback will operate, but you actually say, look, here's, here's how, how it operates. Here's how we get the figure out, you know, within, and you, you, and you say, well, these agreements look to be awfully long. You know, our lawyers paid per word they put in and then paid per word they take out. Well, it, uh, it, in a proper agreement, there, there will be the actual procedure set out. So, you know, but buyer produces a figure to the seller within, I don't know, 30 days after the, after, after the end of the year with, with his workings, if the seller wants to see it, seller then has a certain amount of time to look at it, challenge it if necessary. And if, if there's a challenge and you can't agree, then you go to a third party expert to determine what the figure should be. So what you're trying to do all the time is eliminate as much doubt or, or scope for argument that you, 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 you actually can. And so you put, you know, if, if you look at the agreement, talk about legitimate cause, you actually list what, what, what they are. I, I've seen instances where a, where a buyer has looked at a client base and, and thought, I, I could do, I quite fancy 70% of that, but there's 30% worth of dross in there. So what, what I'll do is after completion, I won't make any effort to re-engage those clients at all i simply won't bother and so they'll wander off and yes i can operate claw back on 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 the, on the ones that have, have gone or i'll shove the prices up because i i i know that those clients won't swallow it and that they'll walk up the road and and, and kind of look at somebody else and so as a seller you, you need to put in that actually the buyer will make reasonable efforts to to engage with all of the client base and it won't put its prices up by more than 5% or 10%. And I've had buyers saying, well, I don't see why I should be hamstrung by the seller in, in my pricing policies. And you say, okay, that's fine. But if you, if you put your price up by 15% and the seller takes a walk or the, the client takes a walk, there's no clawback on that client. You've got to pay for it. And, and so again, it, 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 you know, start with due diligence and then work backwards so that you get as much into your agreement to to make certain the uncertainties as you as you as you can. Now, apart from clawback, again talking to sellers, you would say, well, well, again, we dealt with clawback, and we've as far as we can, we've we've ring fenced it for you, but you've still you're still lending fifty grand to 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 now any bank lending that kind of money. It's going to say, well, I'll, I'll have a debenture, I'll have, I'll have security, and I'll have personal guarantees, uh, and if you default in any payment, the whole lot becomes payable here and now. And those are things that a seller ought to consider at least and raise with the buyer. Because sometimes buyers set up clean new companies to buy a particular practice. So you've got a, 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 a company with no track record, no assets apart from the ones it's just bought and hasn't yet got going, um, and you've lent it fifty thousand. So, say you know, I'll, I'll say, well, I'll have a first fixed and floating charge over your assets. Doesn't shouldn't bother you because it's only going to bite if you effectively don't pay me. But it means that if things go wrong, I'm I'm front of the queue ahead of HMRC and any other poor creditor who who, and at least I might get something out of it um uh i also have a personal guarantee from 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 you the the individual who set this company up because at the end of the day it's a it's a clean 
almost paper company from day one and I, I want you to stand behind the company that you've that you've you set up this is me selling out my life's work to you yeah. and I want and I want you to, to to have the guts or the courage or the decency to these are all the arguments that you run with the other side when they're saying oh, personal, <laughs> personal guarantee filthy word filthy words won't even entertain it and so you sometimes have a discussion with with that you know I, I never advise my clients to give personal guarantees well why won't they stand behind uh, their word if you like and so you you you, you kind of have that that argument and in in the end like a lot of these things it comes down to who wants the deal more you know i'm am i the individual who set this company up prepared to stand behind and say yeah i, I will actually guarantee it because this consideration is only payable if the company performs. So if, if the GRF stacks up, then the cash ought to be there to pay the seller. And this is the seller selling out his life's work. And I understand, you know, how that should be. And yes, if, if I've got a payment period of, of two years, if the company fails after nine months, but there's a chance that some of it is payable, it's got to be payable now. I, I want to be able to, to claim it now from a, an administrator or a liquidator rather than say, well, it's not due for another 15 months. And so you've got, you, you've got that kind of balance. Another one that's quite interesting and I've seen used quite a lot is, is, is where you say to the, to the buyer as a seller, if you're more than a certain days in arrear on either the first, well, it would have to be the first installment or the second um i'll take the practice back so you know after 60 days the clients come back to me i know i know we're treating clients like commodities which <laughs> which they're not and so it's not it's not that quite quite that straightforward but i'll have the clients back any restrictive covenants that i've given get flipped over so they're now given by you to me in respect of of of, of those clients now, as a seller, you might say, well, that's a fat lot of use because I, I don't want it back. You know, I, I might have retired. I might be, you know, sat in the south of France um, having a good time and suddenly uh, I've, I've got a client base back that I've got to service. It, it doesn't, it sounds good in, in theory. I'm not sure it works in practice. But what it does is it makes a buyer think twice about messing a seller around. Um, so if, if a buyer is trying to manage his cash flow and thinking, well, who, who, who can I not pay this month? Or how, well, who, what, what can I defer? I know I'll defer that because he's sat in the south of France. He's got no real clout. And if, he, you know, if, it's, if it's three months, he's got to wait. He might jump up and down and make a, make a racket. But at the end of the day, uh, he's not going to do anything. If you've got that uh, hanging over your head that, that somebody just might say, OK, I'll have it back. I'll keep the 50% you paid me on completion or the, or the first 25% you paid me at the, at the uh, end of year one, I'll keep all that, but I'll also have the client base back and, and you've now given me a restrictive covenant that you won't, you won't. Yeah. Retire. And that's, yeah. that often is accepted actually by, by a, a, a buyer because, you know, you say to, if you, if your client's the buyer, you say, well, you control all this, you control your payment. So you, if, you, if you can't pay him, that's one thing. But if you can pay him and you're just not, then that's down to you and it's something that you control. And you know, if, you've got, if you've got a problem coming up, talk to him. Talk to her, talk to him beforehand so that, that you, you avoid any kind of... And clear it up. And you, you can clear it up. Brilliant. So I've got now, Ian, I've got, we've got 20 minutes or 19 minutes, according to my clock. We've got lots of questions. So now we've covered off GRF payment and clawbacks, which were the three big things that came up uh, in all the preloaded questions. I'm going to go through uh, the questions that have come in this morning. Um, yeah. I'm also, I'm just going to launch a poll. So one of the questions is, um, are there more buyers than sellers on the course? Uh, sorry, on this call? And then just to get a bit of an idea as to whether you actually bought and sold a practice before. So I'm just going to relaunch the poll. So it should 
appear on your screen now. If you could just complete, uh, whether you're on this call because you're looking to buy a practice um, or sell a practice, or you're looking to buy and sell, so buy one and buy a better one, or sell one and buy a better one, or whether you're just interested, and then whether you've actually bought or sold a practice before, uh, perhaps we'll get a bit of a feel for those that, that are on the call. So at the moment, we've got uh, 27 or 63 percent of the people on the call, 62 percent of the people on the call looking to buy, only 4 percent uh, looking to sell, uh, 6 percent looking to do both, and then 28 percent, so a quarter of the people just here to see how it works and uh, look at our pretty faces, Ian, for the, for the, <laughs> for the sound of it. Well, so, what a disappointment for them, Simon. <laughs> so, so on, uh, on, on that basis, it, it is massively uh, in favour of buyers looking to buy rather than people looking to sell at the moment, uh, and about a third of the people on the call have um, got... Uh, uh, sorry, they've bought uh, or sold a practice before and 60% have never been involved of it. Uh, and then there's 6% that have kind of been involved in it before. So I'm not quite sure where, where they sit, but um, that's brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. So questions, Ian, um, as succinctly as possible, if we can, so we can get through as many as, uh, as, many as possible. Um, is there a certain point in the process where the seller should show you client files? I was looking at purchasing a practice last year, but was told I couldn't see the client files until I'd paid at least a percentage of the deal price. So is there, is there a point where you feel as though this, uh, I mean, for, for me, that rings alarm bells. So um, it, it would for me as well. And it's, I mean, in my view, yes, you, you, you've got to be careful. And we talked about NDAs and emphasize that, that perhaps they're not as, uh, as, um, useful as they, as they as they sound in terms of policing, but I can't see how you can you can buy a practice or buy a bank of of fees w without actually looking at the asset that you're buying. You you wouldn't buy a car and not test drive it or look at it, would you? Or you you wouldn't you wouldn't buy a house and not look at it. And people do apparently, but uh, uh, certainly you'd look at it and the, the ideal world you'd you'd have it surveyed uh, to a, a certain extent and i think if you if you're if if, if you've been asked to pay kind of half a million pounds for a, for a, a practice or, or a million and i've done i've actually done a couple of transactions in the last 12 months of a million plus you, you need to have a damn good look at, at, at what you're buying before you, you you actually buy it and and so you've you've it, it is tricky with the timing, um, but I think it, it, you need to to do that at a at a relatively early stage before you get t too far down the legal process. Because the, the whole point with with the way it normally works with heads of agreement, you you agree your heads, they're non-binding apart from what's called a lockout provision that that that's, that says to the seller for the next two months you won't talk to another prospective buyer. And the reason for that is that the, I, the buyer, I'm now going to start spending money on due diligence uh, and legal fees. And so, and, and they can, can rack up, you know, fairly f quickly. And the, the whole, you know, as, as I kind of emphasised this morning, due diligence is king. You, you need, it's all very well having a load of warranties in a, in a, in a share sale agreement. That, that's great. If you're then trying to make a warranty claim, you're chasing the game, or, or you, 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 you're having to prove that 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 warranty's been breached, and as a result, you've suffered that kind of damage. It's much better to find out what you're buying and where the bear traps are, or where the, the pitfalls are, before you actually commit. And that that you know, that could also extend if, if you've got a particular client that can, that that that's generating thirty percent of the of the fee base. One, that should ring alarm bells anyway. You've got to be very careful. But two, you might want to talk to that client ahead of the game to say, look, I'm going to be taking over this practice. Can we have a chat about, about whether you're going to be happy, all things being equal, to carry on using me for what is essentially quite a personal and, and, and important relationship between client and his accountant. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's fiduciary relationship and, 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 and kind of really important. So you need to... To, to, as a buyer to be able to find out wh where the land lies and how the land lies. Otherwise, if, if, you, if you don't do that due diligence or don't make those investigations, 
you're back into the dead client scenario. And it, it brings us back to where we started. It, it, it is that if a seller says to you, no, you can't look at the files, or I'm not even going to give you a, a, a list of who the clients are ahead of the game, to me, that, that would raise some quite serious implications and that I will be, I'll be quite worried about it. Going about doing it. Yeah. I suppose that the, the area where it could be, if I, if I was selling, I could turn around. So say I I'm selling a practice and I get four or five people that are interested in buying it. Um, I could say, right. Okay. You've all got to pay me three grand for argument's sake to prove yep. that you're serious about buying it. And you're not just coming along and wasting my time and having a look and seeing what you could find. But um, yeah, I, th- I, I would have a great deal of difficulty uh, putting, well, signing an agreement uh, uh, before yeah. I see any of that information, definitely. And, and, th- and I think it comes down to supply and demand, doesn't it? It's what, it's, what, it's what we talked about before. If you've got people battering you as a seller, you've got people battering your door down to, to buy your practice, you can then say, okay, you know, I want five grand off each of you to have a proper look, see it, and what you're buying. And, and if it's not you that, that, that buys a practice, that's just tough. It's the, it's the price for actually getting in, in the beauty parade, if you like. And, and, look. and if, you, if as a seller, you're in that happy position, great. Um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a buyer, I might be prepared to pay it, provided it then gives me access to the information and the, the, um, what, what I actually need to make a, a value judgment as to whether this is, is the right practice for me. And... You know, I was going to say at the end, a, a, a lot of, of, of whether this works or not comes down to the personal trust between the buyer and the seller. And, uh, you know, if, you, if, if that's not there, or if you've got doubts about whether what's being held out is for sale actually is for sale. Uh, I, uh, my own view is I wouldn't do it, but wouldn't do it. Okay, um, so let's let's see how many of these we can uh, we can fire through. So Deepak, I believe I've answered or we've answered your question on the way through. Same with you, Yogesh, with regards to the payment terms. Um, I've got a question on, and I know this has come up a, a, a couple of times um, around. Uh, well, a percentage of turnover is subscriptions to zero, uh, where we make a margin. Uh, do, do 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 you consider a sale of software basically to be part of grf or just the margin or would you exclude it completely or is that a, a broker question ian it's probably a broker question i mean it, it, in the end if you if you strip it back to reality it is that it is the margin you're making legitimately a, a recurring fee that you make from that client base if it, if it is then I, I don't see why that shouldn't be added in or you you know it, it's a it's 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 effectively profit or, or, or income from the from your the, the, that you derive from providing a service to your client base um if you then have to pay part of that that on to zero it's 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 just the margin that you're making uh and you're making it every year the, the question again is that recurring um if it is then maybe it should be included it is part of a broker question, but it, but it's also part of the agreement between between buyer and, and seller. What do we mean by recurring fees? What, what let's is, be, and let's be blunt included. about what what are recurring fees and what what aren't. Brilliant, uh, thank you. Uh, and then Kim has asked around what should you agree check before the heads of terms beside GRF? Well, you've talked about uh, anything and everything basically, but the most important one of these is, is the lock the lockout condition or the lockout provision that you talked about. Yeah, in in the heads, it's the lockout provision. So you would say all, all of these terms are non-binding. It's simply well, what heads should do is set out the commercial deal. So, and I don't think there should be more than two, three pages at the most. Otherwise, you're into a big negotiating. You, you might as well go straight to your main main agreement. The, the main thing from a from a from a buyer's perspective is the lockout, and from a seller, I think you've got to accept the lockout. But you would say, look, I'll, I'll, I'll not do anything for two months, provided. But if, if you come back and start to materially change the commercial deal, the lockout falls away. You know, if, if you suddenly come back and say, I'm not going to pay you 1.2, I'm going to pay you one times GRF. I think it's legitimate for a for a for a a seller to say, okay, not acceptable. Lockout falls away because. I, I can sell this somewhere else for 1.2 or, 
I, I, I chose you for a variety of reasons, locked out everybody else. But if you're going to do that, then I, I, I need to be able to go back onto the marketplace and, and, and try and do a deal at 1.2. And I think that that's a legitimate, that, that, for me, that's, that's the main thing that, a, that a, a seller needs to make sure that actually goes into the lockout provisions. Excellent. Thank you. And then Yogish, I think we've answered that question on that one. Uh, generally speaking, uh, in a sentence, Ian, so we can start firing through a few of these. Generally speaking, do, do the practices take on the trading name of the old practice or do they change it into their, into their own name? Depends on how they what they tend to do i think is keep it for a while because they're protecting the, the, the again as a as a seller you're protecting your grf and and so you want to, it's in your interest to make sure the grf is maintained going forward and that the that the buyer maintains the client base and so what you often find sellers saying is i want you to undertake to practice from these premises for 12 months with either under the name or with the name prominently included within the new trading style so that their clients feel comfortable they can still come to the same premises or it's still local and that there's still that connection with with the 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 old practice and particularly if a seller often sellers stay on either for a short while for a handover or they'll stay on for a longer period of one two years as a consultant or as a as an employee to help transfer the goodwill across because it's all very well, it's like saying clients aren't commodities. You, your transfer isn't complete the day you complete the deal, it starts then. What the transfer is, is, is maintaining the clients and, and, and keeping the, the goodwill going forward. Now, one, one, of, one of the fundamentals about all this is, is if I'm buying from a corporate seller, do I, do I buy shares or assets? The, the answer is you buy shares because, um, when you buy shares, you don't have to go out to the client base on day one and re-engage them. If you buy assets, the provider of the service becomes a different legal person. And so you have to actually go to every client and say, we've now taken this practice over. Can you please re-engage with us? Now, of course, lots of clients will say, fine. But some will say, well, I don't know you from Adam. Um, yes, I'm prepared to talk to you and listen to you and see what you've got to say but I'm also going to go and talk to a couple of other practices to see how, how their fee structures uh, stacks up and what, what kind of service they can offer, offer to me. Whereas if you buy the shares, the legal provider of the services stays the same. So it's much easier to manage the transfer of personnel. You no, know, if you've got the same managers working, that, that, that helps, but at, at partner level or director level or whatever, if you if the if the if the seller is being replaced by the buyer it's much easier to do that with a with a share sale or with a share purchase because it, it can be managed uh, much more stealthily if i could put it that way rather than having to having to having to kind of kind of re-engage so as, a, as a seller you you want to keep as much of the old style going at least in the short term but again uh, probably not, not got time here now but to talk about management styles and 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 how 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 systems work you know if, if you've got a client base that's used to coming in with a plastic bag full of receipts the day before their accounts are due to be filed um you, you're going to have difficulty migrating them to if you're a more modern practice where everyone signed up to zero and and uh, that that kind of thing doesn't happen and so you've it, it it's quite it's not as easy as you perhaps think to manage. It's all about managing a transition from one one practice to another, when it's in both parties' interest to make sure it's it, it's it's done right. Right. So we've got we've got five minutes left. I'm just going to put your contact details in the chat box, Ian. So if anybody wants to get in touch with you, it's Ian Worthington at Coliseum, and that's Ian at Coliseum.me.uk. And there's a mobile telephone number there as well because we've got uh, 30 questions uh, still OS. They won't. We will have covered some of them off, but uh, obviously we're not going to get a chance to cover all 30 of those uh, off in the next uh, four minutes. So if you've got any conversations you want to have with Ian uh, and need Ian's help in either buying or selling. 
uh, the, the one of the questions is is can I can I find out who the t who the four percent is on the call that are selling? Uh, well, the simple answer to that is uh, only if they let me. So if, if you're if you're looking to sell, and you would like me to share that with the gaggle, is it a gaggle of buyers we've got on the call? Then I will gladly do that. But uh, yeah. obviously, I can't just. <laughs> disclose who that is without, uh, without yeah. their permission and, and i think the normal brokerage commission is about five percent simon just oh perfect so that, that answers nikolai's question so what is the typical commission fee so, there you go. Yeah. so that's that's five percent so we've we've nailed uh, nailed that one uh, penny has asked um, if customers are paying by direct debit um does that improve or detract from the multiple um i'm i'm not I don't know whether it has a material effect or not. It, it, it certainly would be more attractive, I think, to a, to, to a buyer. If you've got a client base that's used to, to uh, regular uh, payments, often up front, because it obviously re it, it will reduce the bad debt risk uh, and it's great for cash flow. So if, if you've got a client base that's, that, that's attuned to that, then, chances are that that it will be more attractive whether it actually has a, an impact on the price i'm not i'm not sure yeah so there's, um, a, there's a, it's, again it's an, an, an opinion thing there's a, a a chap that we have uh, that presents on negotiation uh, he, he presents at the mastermind groups uh, and he always talks about the person that wins any negotiation is the person with the best plan b yeah, so every, everybody goes into a negotiation with their plan A, but yeah. never think about their best, their plan B. And the person that always wins is the person with the best alternative because they are less committed to the uh, less committed to the deal. So that that would uh, come out in there. Uh, Craig, I believe we've answered your question on the uh, PG. Uh, Andrew, what's the average percentage level of clawback in your experience? Again, it negotiated. Is that the? Uh, yeah, it is really. Um, it, it, it's it's all down to the relative strength and bargaining positions of the of the of the of the parties. Uh, you know how how keen are you to sell? How desperate are you to get your hands on that particular practice? Because it because it's great or strategically suits you really well, or it's got some great clients you want, or there's a couple of superstar managers in there that that, that can really help your 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 business. So I don't think there's a necessarily a hard and hard and hard and fast the kind of logical point is you know i'll i'll take 100 percent back based on 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 the multiplier so if there's a if, if there's a 30 grand shortfall and then I've, I've bought on a on on a, a one times so that that's what i want to claw back because that represents the loss that i've, I've sustained as, as a result but you, you know if if you've got four people queuing up to buy your practice um you can drive a much harder bargain on that and 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 say and I've I've heard people say, look, it's a, it's only the last it's only the last payment that's susceptible to clawback. So, seventy five percent is in, is inviolable. You can only you can only claw back the last the last payment. And to be frank, if you if you if you've lost a quarter of the clients or a quarter of the clients haven't come through, something's gone something's gone wrong really. And, and the, the, the the kind of chances are that it's not the practice that you thought it was. Or, or that that you're not the right person to take it forward because you just aren't aren't the right fit, and brokers don't don't bother looking at at the fit between the the buyer and the seller, and it's really really important. And you just look as as the time goes by. I've, I've actually for a client who who's, I bought five practices for, and and I, before this I rang him up and said, look, can you can you give me one pearl of advice, and and and, and he said basically you've you've got to trust your gut on dealing with the seller and look at the practice and, and and say is it is it the right fit will these clients fit in with my systems will this practice be susceptible to be transported across to my systems um, and, and if if yes then most of the things you can you can overcome but if you you, you need to, to look where the brokers don't to say are we a good fit here or are, 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 are the cultures between the two never going to meld and if the answer is no then no end of bits of paper will 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 make it work for you really and you know that's the 
that's the main message I'd like you to take away from this is due diligence. Do we fit together? Um, yeah. And trust basically and, and, yeah. and know about their culture. That's brilliant. You, you've all wrapped that up like a professionally in this morning. You know, we just got, we've gone one minute over time. We've got 25 questions that um, we've not, I've not been able to ask. Um, well, so what, well, what, what are, time, and if people want to email me, I'll happily perfect so so ian's ian's details are in the in in the chat box if you'd like to e email him then ian will uh, gladly come back to you uh, one of the questions was could you recommend a good solicitor for a purchase so i, I <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just just to be clear ian is a is a is a solicitor that deals with uh, mergers and acquisitions he's not a broker so he's not buying and selling practices uh, he gets involved after the broker has, has been involved or me if any of the two others want to uh, want to uh, appoint me as their broker with regards to the sale so uh, that's fantastic we will also as always carry on the conversation within the facebook group so if you're not a member of the facebook group if you go to www.theaccountantsmastermind.com forward slash community that will take you to the uh, the, the facebook group on facebook so that's www.theaccountantsmastermind.com uh, forward slash community that will take you to the facebook group and i'll start a thread as i normally do to continue uh, this conversation that just leaves me to say uh, thank you very much to everybody that's uh, that's come along thank you very much to everybody that's asked uh, questions and i apologize that we haven't managed to get through uh, them all but it's obviously an, it's an interesting subject and a, and a passionate subject for everybody and then finally of course uh, say thank you uh, to Ian. I've got lots of thank yous coming through on the chat box, Ian. So thank you very much, to you. Ian, uh, for your contribution this morning and for sharing so uh, openly. And uh, because of the uh, slight technical hitch to start with, you missed your virtual round of applause, Ian. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go out with a virtual round of applause and say thank you very much for coming along, Ian. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.